يعملون ما كانوا يعملون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, we will attempt, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, to go through quickly five of Allah's beautiful names. And a lot of the people have wondered why are we taking it in a very haste fashion? And this is a legitimate question. One name may require three or four episodes to talk about. But, I, but as I stated earlier, the way of expanding on Allah's beautiful name is to cement aqidah in the hearts and to strengthen the iman, which unfortunately in such a TV show is not possible due to time constraints. Especially we are doing this series in Ramadan, which might end after six days or maybe a week or so. And then we don't want to leave the people not covering the vast majority of Allah's beautiful names. So this is why we concentrate on giving you the word, the meaning, and some of the implications that may help you later on whenever you recall this name. So the first name today is Al-Mubin. And this name was mentioned in the Quran, referring to Allah Azza wa Jal only once. But it was used to refer to the Quran, the Prophet Wasallam, the, the religion of Allah, and so many other signs. But as a name of Allah, it was mentioned in Surah An-Nur, verse 25, Allah says, يَوْمَ إِذِي يُوَفِّيهِمُ اللَّهُ دِينَهُمُ الْحَقُّ وَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقُّ الْمُبِينَ Allah is the ultimate truth that is the clear and manifest one. So, المُبِين means the clear, the obvious, the apparent, the manifest one. And... Ibn Jarir says, on the Day of Judgment, this ayah is referring to that the facts would be undisputed and the hypocrites would learn, unfortunately, the hard way that what they were disbelieving in is the ultimate truth when they see Allah's torment, when they see hellfire awaiting them. Only then the doubt is removed from their hearts and they would believe in what they were promised. And Al-Khattabi says, Al-Mubin means the undisputed one. No one disputes in Allah Azza wa Jal. And this called scholars to define Al-Mubin in two types, in two ways. One, that Allah Azza wa Jal Himself is evident. He is the manifest one. By himself, his lordship, worship, and beautiful names and attributes are recognized through nature. Human nature recognizes that there is only one creator that exists in this universe. He's the creator of the universe, Azza wa Jal. Even if no one taught them this. This is their inner fitrah and nature that dictates that they believe in Allah. So Allah is al-mubin in the sense that anyone who contemplates can find the reality of Allah's existence and Allah being the Lord of the universe. universe. The second meaning is not only that Allah is apparent in himself, that Allah is obvious. Rather, he himself had sent us signs and messengers and books and revelations to direct people 
to guide people and to explain to people their purpose of existence and that Allah Azza wa Jal is to be worshipped and worshipped alone. By this, we understand when we say Allah is Al-Haqq, the ultimate truth, and Al-Mubeen, the clear and the manifest one, we understand that he is truly clear and obvious and apparent to anyone who has a clear conscience that enables him to see. Now, the name that came before Al-Mubin in the previous ayah was Al-Haqq. And Al-Haqq is the true one. So, Haqq means truth, means right. But when it is with Allah's name, we find that it is the ultimate truth that is undisputed. And this was mentioned in many verses among them. Allah says, فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكَ الْحَقِّ So here Allah describes himself with two names. Al-Malik, the sovereign, the king, the ruler, which we covered before. And then he says, al the true one. And why would we say Allah is the ultimate truth? Because everything else is falsehood. Anyone else who's worshipped other than Allah is false, has no reality. And truth is the opposite of falsehood. So when you have Allah to be the truth and everything from Him is true, and everything that goes back to him is true, and all what he orders and forbids is true, and all the servants he created must comply to this truth, then you know that Allah is the ultimate truth, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only true thing that exists, and exists by himself without needing anyone. He's totally independent. He is perfect in his attributes and his description and his actions and his words. He is the truth in being kind to his creation. Whatever he says is true. Whatever he does is true. And this is why the Prophet Assam, whenever he woke up in the middle of the night, he would use he used to say a beautiful name praising Allah, beautiful names of Allah. He used to say, Allahumma lak alhamd, praise be to you. Anta qayyimu samawati wal ard, wa man fihinna wa lak alhamd. Qayyim, qayyum, qayyam. We've covered this. Anta nuru samawati wal ard, wa man fihinna wa lak alhamd. You're the light. And we will come to that, inshallah, later on. Anta maliku samawati wal ard, wa man fihinna wa lak alhamd. You're the you're the reign or the sovereign or the king or the ruler of the heavens and the earth and what's between them. Then he goes, Anta al haq You are haq the true one. Wa qawluka al haq Your rhetoric is haq Wa wa'duka al haq Your promise is true. al haq And he goes on repeating the word haq haq that anything related to Allah is the ultimate truth. And he has no associates his books are true his messengers are true the day of judgment are uh, is true and so on so the name al-haq to describe allah azza wa jal is indeed one of allah's beautiful names the third name the third name we have is al-barr and this name was mentioned once in surat at-tur allah says إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلُ نَدْعُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْبَرُّ الرَّحِيمُ البر. Now, a lot of us know what albir is. And albir is doing good, expansion of things, connecting to your relatives, all of this, includes al-bir 
And some scholars consider bir to be a general or generic word that under its umbrella, everything falls. Everything that is good and appreciated in Sharia ah falls under the word al-bir. And other scholars elaborate and say truth, worship, um, connecting you to, to your kinship, being dutiful to your parents, all of this is considered to be bir. When you say barrun, this is Allah's name, Allahu al-bar. Now this means that Allah is the subject, is the one who delivers kindness to his servants. He's the one who expands his bounties and favors over them. He's the one who has compassion. He never refrains from delivering goodness to his servants despite their sinning and disobeying him. He is the truthful in his promise. He promised the righteous that he would admit them to Jannah and this is what they praise Allah on the day of judgment for them being fearful of him and now he's being kind to them and admitting them to Jannah, keeping his promise. So all of these gifts, favors and blessings from Allah to his servants are general. But those specific limited addition of Allah's favors and blessing are given only to his righteous servants who are guided to do good deeds, who are selected, who are chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal, who Allah grants them a sincere repentance. And not everyone is guided to this as we spoke in the beautiful name of At-Tawwab. He's the one who directs them and guides them and helps them to do good, th good deeds and to direct them to know their way in Jannah. When there is no GPS, they know their way by what Allah has installed in them. And this is part of his bir. And this is why we call him al-barr. So it is always in this ayah, as you see, associated with the merciful, al-barr al-rahim. But bar is vaster and more specific in the things that are given to his servants. The fourth name today is Al-Hamid. And Al-Hamid is the one who is deservedly praised. So what does Al-Hamid mean? Al-Hamid means the praised one the one who is praised due to his actions or due to his attributes and nature. He's the one, Al-Hamid, who's praised whether in good times or bad times. He's the one, that is Al-Hamid, who is praised in prosperity as well as in hardship because we praise him because we know he is wise and none of his actions may bear any error. Allah Azza wa is infallible. Allah does not make mistakes. So whatever he does, he's praised for that. And he is Al-Hamid. Now, only Allah Azza wa Jal is praised for all of his actions and for all of his speech and for all of his decrees because there is no God worthy of being worshipped except him. What is the difference between Al-Hamid and Al-Mahmud? And this is a very delicate difference that I haven't seen anyone pointing to it other than Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah. Ibn Al-Qayyim says, the word Hamid rhymes with Habib, Karim, Sharif, and so on. 
and it refers to the description and an attribute. And he says, for example, Habib to a lot of the people is equivalent to Mahbub. And I know these two names are very famous in um, the subcontinent. They call a lot of the boys Habib and Mahbub. But he says there's a delicate difference. Mahbub means the loved one, the one who is loved. However, Mahbub requires people to love this person. So you can't have someone who's Mahbub without any fans loving him. While Habib means that he is loved even if there's nobody there to love him. Why? Because he has the qualities to be loved. Now he looks back to this beautiful name of Al-Hamid. What's the difference between Al-Hamid and Al-Mahmud? Al-Mahmud is not one of Allah's names. Because Mahmud means the praised one. However, this requires that there are fans who praise him. While Al-Hamid is the one praised by himself. Whether there are fans to praise him or there's no one on earth to praise him. Because he's the ultimate deserving of being praised. And this is why this is one of Allah's beautiful names that existed even when there was no creation, none whatsoever. Allah was always Al-Hamid. And he was always the praised one because of his beautiful attributes and because of the causes of being praised it were always there in himself. Finally, we go to the last name we have tonight, which is Al-Wahhab. Al-Wahhab. And this is a beautiful name of Allah Azza wa Jal, similar to Al-Mu'ti, the giver. And this name was mentioned a lot of times in the Quran. And if you notice, when it comes, you'll find a little delicate secret in there. So Al-Wahhab comes from the origin of Hiba. And Hiba is a gift. To give someone a gift, you give him a Hiba. And you would be considered a Wahib, as in the Arabic translation of organ donors, they call him Wahib. He's a donor. But when you frequently give and not stop giving, this becomes the name of Allah, Al-Wahhab, the frequently bestower, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'm going to read to you three verses of the Quran. And you notice what delicate secret there is in it. So the first one, Allah says, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Who say, O oh, our Lord, let not our hearts deviate after you have guided us and grant us from yourself mercy. Indeed, you are the bestower. So point one, to remain steadfast on Islam, use the word or the name Al-Wahhab. Our Lord, let not our hearts deviate. This is one of the beautiful names you call Allah when you want him to make your heart steadfast. Allah says, or do they have the, the vaults or the deposit depositories of the mercy of your Lord, the, excellent, the, the exalted in might, the bestower? So when you want what is in Allah's vaults and depositories, in Allah's mercy, in Allah's provision, use the word Wahhab. And finally, Sulaiman, peace be upon him, the prophet, used to say, he prayed, my Lord, forgive me and grant me an authority that will never be matched by anyone after me. You are indeed the giver of all bounties. Innaka anta al-Wahhab, the bestower. So Ibn Jarir says, when you look at the word al-Wahhab, this tells you that Allah is the giver of his servants. 
how to see right from wrong, how to reach success, how to remain steadfast on religion, how to believe in Allah's books and messengers. So Al-Wahhab is one of Allah's beautiful names and he gives to whomever he wishes or wills of his servants, whether it's wealth, whether it's children, whether it is reign and authority, and whether it is prophethood. And this is only for Allah Azza wa Jal, and that is why the name Al-Wahhab is always associated with great gifts from Allah, such as mercy, reign, authority, offspring, and prophethood, and to be strengthened by a good prophet, brother, etc. As you will find this manifested whenever you read the Quran and go through these beautiful verses of the Quran. So always remember this beautiful name, Al-Wahhab, and call Allah Azza wa Jal, knowing that no one bestows a, a, a goodness and favors and blessings upon you except Him, Azza wa Jal. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll re be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we're going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered his companions to love the poor and be close to them. Abu Thar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anh said, My intimate friend sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered me with seven things to love the poor and be close to them, to look at those who are below me and not those who are above me to keep the ties of the womb no matter how far they are to not ask anyone for anything to say the truth even if it is bitter to not fear when standing up for Allah's rights the blame of anyone that blames and he ordered me to say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah there is no ability or strength except through Allah because it is from a treasure beneath the throne. Reported by Ahmad, Albani ruled it authentic in As Sahih. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We'll take your callers, uh, live callers, inshallah. Abdullah from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. I have a brief question. And the adhkar after the fard salah, uh, I've seen in uh, the app that I have that when you say subhanallah 33 times, after you, do you say alhamdulillah or walhamdulillah? And after that, you say, Allahu Akbar or Wallahu Akbar? It's the same. So whether you say Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, or you say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, or you say Subhanallah, 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 until you finish 33, then you say Alhamdulillah, 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 33, and Allahu Akbar the same. It's all the same, Akhi. Whether you say Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, or Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. It's the same. There's no problem in that, inshallah. Um, we have Shihab from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Shantullah. Sheikh, today I found out that uh, I memorized one verse of the Quran wrongly and prayed many salah with that. Uh, what should I do now? Okay. The answer is that there is nothing for you to do. Allah Azza wa Jal said at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, Rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina aw Oh Allah, don't hold us accountable if we were to forget or to make an error. And you made an error. There is nothing wrong uh, on you, insha'Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, Taymur from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Shantullah. 
my, my question is regarding the witr prayer. So um, in congregation, when the imam prays the witr prayer and we, he recites the dua, after the imam recites the dua, the congregation wipe their um, they wipe, they wipe their face with their hands after the imam recites the dua. It is innovation. Okay. So wiping the face after the dua is an issue of dispute. And the reason is that the hadith that is found is extremely weak and not authentic. And this is why Ibn Abdul Barr, one of the great scholars of Al-Maliki school, used to say, wiping the face after the dua is only done by the ignorant, people who have no knowledge. So it is not part of the sunnah to make it. Those who do it, we don't usually comment on it because they are following a, a, a weak a hadith, hadith and some schools may allow following weak hadiths when there is no, no relationship between aqidah issues or halal and haram as they call it fada'il al-a'mal and this is their preference so uh, be it but the most authentic opinion that this is not from the sunnah at all um, Jannah to Jannah from USA um, Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Assalamu alaikum I have a question that uh, uh, that uh, when uh, men are outside like they're traveling they pray and they can pray anywhere they want but what about for the woman and uh, can they pray inside the car if it's like a uh, they're traveling or do they do the same for like the man? Okay, this is a very, mis, uh, very well-known misconception among the females. They think that they cannot pray in front of people. They think that if they bow and prostrate in the open or in front of men or in front of kafir, that they are committing a sinful thing. And this is totally bogus. A woman, is like a man she's covered she is wearing her abaya she is covering her aura when time of prayer is due she can park her car and pray next to her car people watching no problem she prays in the office no problem she prays in the mall where people are walking and she takes a, 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 a corner no problem at all when people look at her they can't see a thing because she is covered from head to toe and there's nothing wrong in that praying in the car is not permissible praying standing up in fard prayer is a pillar you cannot compromise that pillar unless you are disabled or unable to pray standing up due to um, an illness camel from saudi salam <laughs> Yeah, my query is offshore workers must go to the sailing for a certain period of month. Within this period, they need to move from to one platform to another. Is it they consider, is it they consider residing or traveling? In the sense, they can combine their prayer because they have their own accommodation. They stay on their vessel. You, do, are you talking about sailors? Uh, sailors, sailors and off, offshore workers. Okay. So this is a, an issue of dispute among scholars. The vast majority consider these sailors to be travelers. And there are some scholars who consider them to be residing because they're 24-7 for months without end on their vessels, traveling from one place to the other. But they have their accommodation, they have their cabins, they know the t times of prayer, the morning and evening. I am inclined to follow the opinion that says that they are travelers. So they can combine, they can shorten their prayers. They don't have any Jum'a because they're not residing in a village or a town. They are uh, travelers like nomads. So there is no Jum'a upon them, none whatsoever, even if they travel for six months, which is a little bit far-fetched. You know, usually it is four to five weeks and then they'll have time off. So, yes, they are exempted from uh, um, completing the prayers. They can shorten and they can combine if needed. Um, then we have Muhammad from the U.S. 
السلام علیکم شیخ سلامت اللہ شیخ مائی کوشچن از ان سینریو وین آئی میک اوزو اینڈ آئی پریڈ لائک زہر پریئر دین آئی واز ریسائڈنگ سم تھنگ اور آئی ایم ڈوئنگ سم ریسرچ آن مائی فون اینڈ آئی فال اسلیپ اینڈ وین آئی اوک اپ آئی نو دیٹ آئی نیڈ ٹو میک اے فریش اوزو فار دا آسر پریئر بٹ فار سم ریزن آئی ٹوٹلی فار گوڈ اٹ اینڈ آئی پریڈ دا آسر اینڈ آفٹر فنیشنگ دا لائک آفٹر آفرنگ سلام or maybe a little later, I realized that I forgot to do Udu. In that case, do I need to uh, make Udu and pray again? Okay, Ma um, Muhammad, there is a difference between forgetting Wudu and forgetting an impurity. If I have an impurity on my clothes, a cloth or a piece of uh, uh, my garment, and I forgot about it and I prayed, and after finishing prayer, I remembered my prayer is valid. But if I forgot to take major ritual impurity, ghusl, or I forgot to make wudu, and I prayed, I have to repeat all the prayers that I offered because this is a condition. Without it, the prayer is invalid. So if you forgot, if you were mistaken, as long as you did not perform wudu, you have to pray all the prayers that you've missed because of that reason. Ma'roof from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu um, Sheikh, um, at the time of marriage with a, with a lady, the father was nowhere to be found. So the mother lives with the daughter and the, the, the brothers. And so we couldn't consult the father. So the brother approved and the marriage went ahead. A couple of years later, the father came along. Initially, he wasn't um, happy, but later on he approved. Um, does the marriage have to be repeated or that's sufficient? Okay. First of all, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, there is no marriage without the presence of a guardian, a wali. And no one can override the wali or the guardian's permission just because he was not found or because they don't want to. So what, you, what they have done was wrong. And the marriage where the brother of the bride was her guardian is debatable. And most jurors would say that it was invalid because they have overridden their original guardian's approval and consent. Only the father can give his daughter in marriage. If he was not to be found anywhere, they tried desperately, then they should go to the Muslim court or to the Islamic uh, uh, center, the authorized Islamic center, and consult the authorities what to do. If the authorities are convinced, because most, if not all, such similar cases, the girl wants to marry the boy, they don't want to tell the father because they know the father would not agree. They tried to give him a call once or twice after midnight and the mobile was off. So they said, we tried our level best, let's get it over with. And this is a trick that does not pass upon Allah Azza wa Jal. So if he is now accepting, then they should renew the marriage contract with him being the guardian, proposing to the, uh, the man that I'm giving you my daughter in marriage, and he accepts in the presence of two male witnesses, and this, inshallah, would uh, uh, rectify things. May Allah forgive them all. A sad man from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, my question is, in my country, if someone wants to bring something from another country, he has to pay tax. Mm. But some people bring electronic products such as a smartphone without paying tax and hiding from the inspection. These phones get sold in the malls and market openly. Government rarely finds and takes a step about this. Can I buy from these sellers? Well, actually, the one who is importing it is committing a sin but if you find it displayed in the market and it's for sale 
and the authorities know about it and they do not confiscate it, they do not uh, take it out and what you're doing is not illegal because you're buying something from a store, there's nothing wrong in buying it insha'Allah. Uh, Abu Abdurrahman from Italy. Assalamu alaikum ya Sheikh. Alaikum Yes, my question is, I'm Italian but my, my wife is in my original country. I try to find a Quranic teacher for her, a female, but nearly three months I could not find it. Can I get a man, a young boy who can teach her so that she can try to learn Quran? Okay, it is not permissible for a man to teach a woman Quran because this is not mandatory. It is not like my wife has cancer and we could not find any female doctor. Can I take her to a male doctor? The answer is yes. This is a necessity. It's a must. But teaching your wife the Quran is not mandatory. It is not something that is a life-threatening issue. Rather, being with a non-mahram man and learning Quran from him is dubious and risky. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, and one of the scholars of the companions said, do not be alone with a woman, even if to teach her the Quran. This is one of the means and steps of Satan that creeps in. He creeps in without you feeling it. So this is totally prohibited. Ya Aba Abdul Rahman. Abdullah from Spain. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu I would like to ask, what level of certainty do you need to nullify your fast? For example, there was a day that we, I was fasting, and I know that stem breaks the fast, and I had a hot a shower with hot water, and there was stem in the bathroom. There was I what? Stem. Steam. In the bathroom. Steam, yes, steam. Okay. And. I saw stem in, steam in the other part of the bathroom, but I'm not sure if there was stem exactly in the spot where I was having a shower and I inhaled, I, I, I was breathing. Did that invite my fast? So and does, are you married, Abdullah? No. Okay, do you have a mother? Yes. So when your mother cooks food and she smells the food and the steam coming from the pots, is her fasting valid or not? Yes, because it is a necessity, maybe. No, no, it's not a necessity. She can buy food from outside. Achi, the steam doesn't break your fasting. Those who work in desalination plants or in factories or elsewhere, they are bound to smell the steam. If I walk in the, super, in, in the market, in the souk, and there's this guy doing barbecue, and I sit there and, ah... Oh, have I eaten? And the, the restaurant owner comes and said, okay, you have to give me uh, five euros for the smell. No, this is not eating, this is not drinking. Take a shower as much as you want. This has no impact on your fasting. Nariman from Lebanon. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu uh, Sheikh, I'd like to know if a person's reputation in the dunya benefits him at all in the akhirah, like when a person is known among relatives or people to be pious with good character, but deep down, He's a sinner, he's not perfect, and he's trying to be a good Muslim. Does this benefit him at all? Well, first of all, the norm is that we are the witnesses of Allah on earth. In an authentic hadith, a group of people passed by the Prophet ﷺ carrying a dead person. So they're carrying him to the graveyard. So the people said, MashaAllah, this is so and so individual, this person, he was good, he was this, he was that. The Prophet said, Wajabat. It is done. And then another corpse came, carried by men, and the audience with the Prophet started slandering and cursing him. Oh, this evil person, he's miser, he's this, he doesn't pray, he's a hypocrite. And the Prophet said, Wajabat. So the companion said, what do you mean by wajabat? He said, you testified for the first one of doing good things. So Jannah is deserved for him. And the other one, you testified that he's an evil person. So hellfire, he deserves hellfire because of your testimony. You, the Prophet said, are the 
witnesses of Allah on earth. So generally speaking, yes, this has value for people on the day of judgment. What people think of you counts. The problem is what's inside of your heart. This is what only Allah knows. And we pray to Allah that he never exposes us, neither in this life or in the hereafter. Yet the general trend is that the people will testify for you and Allah would accept their uh, testimony. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Aftab from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuhu. Um, the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are learning through these episodes, mashallah. Uh, I want to know how do we know these names? I mean, is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us uh, when the revelation came that this particular revelation, this particular word is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Akhi, this Allah. is well known from reading the Quran and the Prophet Sunnah. So the Quran, if you read it from cover to cover, you will find many names of Allah. And the scholars came and said, okay, Allah, Al-Haq, Al-Mubin, Al-Muhaymin, Al-Musaytir, all of these are in the Quran. So they listed them down. And they went to the Hadith and they found that the, the Prophet said, Inna Allah huwa al-mu'ti wa ana qasim. So one of Allah's name is Al-Mu'ti. So they documented it. And hence we have these beautiful names and attributes only by the Quran and the Prophet Sunnah, not by the companions or anyone else. This is the only legitimate, authentic way of knowing Allah's beautiful names. Mahfoud from Indonesia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shaykh. Alaykum assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, uh, regarding the sunken Indonesian Navy submarine incident, uh, authorities said the sailors uh, in the submarine have passed away in the sea. Uh, although we haven't seen the bodies physically, mm. uh, for that, can I offer an absentee funeral prayer or salatul ghaib individually at my home for them? Hi, oh, Allah, Sheikh. Okay. First of all, Salatul Ghaib is performed upon those whom no one has offered funeral prayer. So for those sailors who died in the submarine, and I read a couple of days ago that they found a, a grease box uh, uh, for the telescope or a viroscope, viroscope, whatever they call it, which may indicate the vicinity of the submarine, which will lead, inshallah, to them finding the submarine and retrieving the bodies. Once this is done, there will be a funeral prayer offered. If this is not done, if they don't find any traces of it, like the Malaysian airliner that, was, uh, uh, that fell four or five years ago. So what to do? In this case, we, as a government or as a country, would conduct Salatul Ghaib but not individuals in their homes. So this has to be done in congregation with uh, a coordination of the authorities and Allah knows best. A man from India. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu My question is regarding zakat on gold. Do we need to calculate zakat based on present resale value or at, the way, or at which I bought it? And do we calculate zakat on jewelry, which is worn daily? Okay, these are two questions. You have cheated and sneaked a second question, but uh, being forgiving and, and merciful, I will let that go. Uh, zakat al dhahab or the uh, zakat on gold, you estimate the value of the gold today, regardless how much you paid for it 10 years ago. Maybe you paid 10 years ago for it peanuts, and now it's in the thousands. You have to estimate the value today and give 2.5%. Even if the opposite happened, if you bought it for thousands and today is peanuts, you give the value, the zakat of the value of today and not the buying value, rather the selling. Because when you buy, you buy it high. I'm not buying, I'm selling what I have. So you get the uh, a selling price and give 
percent on that. As for the jewelry, the gold and silver, and this is a misconception that a lot of the Muslims have, they think that we have to give zakat on jewelry. This is not true. You have to give zakat on gold and silver, which means that platinum is not zakatable. Diamonds, even if they are forever, they are not zakatable. Rubies, precious uh, stones, emeralds, etc., not zakatable. Only the metal of gold and silver. So a woman who has a necklace of diamond that is worth 10,000 pounds, she takes it to the jeweler's shop and he says that there is only 15 grams of gold. There's no zakat on it. While another piece of necklace gold or bracelet that might be way, way cheaper than this diamond necklace, there has to be zakat if it exceeds 85 grams of silver or the total, and Allah knows best. Zahid from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I wanted to know, um, how, are we allowed to greet um, non-Muslims like before they greet us? Okay, so greeting in Islam usually refers to assalamu alaikum. This is the greeting uh, uh, in Islam. To begin a non-Muslim with assalamu alaikum is totally prohibited. Totally, full stop. And if there was a Muslim and a Christian in the same place, I would say assalamu alaikum, intending the Muslim, not the kafir. But greeting in other forms, so I go to the company, my company, I go to the office and I see my subordinate, my colleague, my supervisor, and I say, hey, good morning, what's cooking? Good looking? No problem. This is a permissible greeting. Good morning, how are you, hi, good day, no problem. The haram thing to initiate is saying assalamu alaikum. And finally, we have Faizan from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Samtullah. Sheikh, my question was that uh, while praying, we stand for a very short period of time between Rukua and Sujood after saying Sami Allah Liman Hamida. So I noticed that some people, as this is a short time, they, for example, are scratching their heads for the whole time. So they go to Sujood without their limbs being still for a me or even a moment. Uh, does this mean that they missed the pillar of Tuma'mina? Yes. If a person was in Rukur and he says, Sami Allah Liman Hamida and goes to Sujood, he did not erect and stood with tranquility, this uh, uh, pillar of Tuma'nina is gone and his prayer is invalid. And so is today's or tonight's episode. It's not invalid, but it's over. Uh, we come to an end. So until we meet tomorrow, same time, I leave you. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Walillahil asma'u al-husna fadu'uhu biha. وذروا الذين يلحدون في أسمائه سيجزون ما كانوا يعملون